you may well good morning brethren and sisters it is sunday the 29th of march and we're living in extraordinary times and as it so happens the daily reading in the new testament has fallen on luke chapter 21 which is probably one of the most appropriate chapters for the circumstances in which we find ourselves today we're meeting here in a small family group by government decree that there be no gatherings of people in places of worship and other places of course and it's like this around the world it's extraordinary there's never been a time like this and the word that is being used of course probably most predominantly on the news services is unprecedented and it is unquestionably unprecedented times in which we're living so i thought we would have a few thoughts on the current situation based upon the lord's words here in luke 21 and other places uh, where he deals with what we call the olivet prophecy when you read in verse verse 34 these words it gives us the clue as to where we sit in the scheme of things he says in his exhortation take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life and so that day come upon you unawares the idea of surfeiting is to have a headache through intoxication Uh, the idea of the cares of this life that that word marimna means uh, dividing or distracting the mind through anxious care now I think we see anxious care but the reason I wanted to start with that verse is it is one of many in which the Lord tells us very plainly that he's not going to return at a time of high expectation and I think we would agree that we're in a time of high expectation I'm receiving a lot of emails from all over the world from people are saying what do you think about this situation how close are we to the return of Christ well we're close to the return of Christ we know that but the Lord has made it very plain he's not going to come at a time when everybody is in a state of high expectation he's going to come when things are normal when men have gone back to their their way of prosperity and the cares and the distractions of life and if you read on that's the clue given in verse 35 for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth if Christ turned up today it wouldn't really be a snare to many people to the ignorant of course in the world it would be a snare but to us the Christian and that's what this message is about to his servants it wouldn't be a snare and we'll come back to this passage later on because that word dwell there is very very important in this context that's why he says in verse 36 watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man now that exhortation is given in different forms in the records that we have of the Olivet prophecy so I want you to come back to Matthew chapter 24 and have a look at the way it's framed there now Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42 we read similar words but the the message that comes through is that the Lord is warning that his return would catch unfortunately would catch some of his people by surprise verse 42 watch therefore for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come but know this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up in other words what he's saying in that passage is that when you're in a state of high expectation sensitive to the return of Christ which is I think the state that most of us have felt in recent days that's not the time he's going to come he's going to come when you're more relaxed when you've gone back to normal life that's his warning here that's why he says in verse 44 therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh and that phrase is rendered by Rotherham in such an hour as ye are not thinking and that is not thinking that he was going to come at that time it's a normal time not a time of crisis not a time of high activity and expectation we'll probably just come down now to verse 48 because he carries on with it. he says but and if that evil servant and this is the servant who has done the right thing in verses 45 and verses 46 but if that evil servant shall say in his heart my lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants to eat and to drink with the drunken the lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of now that's the same message isn't it it's the message that he's not going to come at a time when you expect him to come now i believe christ will probably come this year and i've made that pretty plain in talks that i've given recently but it will be later in the year when things are settled back when things are back to basically normal and i think that probably is what what will happen and if, if this virus continues to go on for the next 12 months then maybe he won't come this year because the warning is clear he will come at a time when things are quiet and normal and some of his people are thinking well he's not going to come right that's 
the clear message of scripture. So come to Mark chapter 13, because that's the other record of the Olivet Prophecy. Mark 13, and we're going to start at verse 32, which is this final exhortation, very similar to Luke 21, but different wording here. Verse 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now that was true at the time when he stated that in AD 30. He didn't know the day or hour or even the year of his return. Only God knew that. But of course when he arrived at the right hand of the Father, he had to be informed of that day because he then took over the management of the angels who would make sure that the prophecies would be fulfilled so that that day would come to pass when God had appointed it. So Christ got that information when he arrived and took over the charge of the angels. He took over from Michael the archangel. So he knew, of course, he knew when he would be crucified from the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. But he didn't know about his, the date of his second advent. Verse 33, Take ye heed, he says, watch ye and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at mid night or the cock crowing or in the morning lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what I say unto you I say unto all watch I think the clear message there is we, we need to understand that he will come at a time when the expectations are not high more normal times when men have gone back to, to their ways of prosperity that's why his warning in Luke 17 is so relevant isn't it remember Lot's wife she didn't want anything to change she was happy with her circumstances she enjoyed the prosperity of Sodom She didn't want anything to change. That's the warning he gives. And we will be removed from times of prosperity. We know that. We know that from Luke 17. We know it from Matthew 24. We know it from Revelation chapter 3. Plain the message. When he wrote the letter to the Laodiceans, you'll remember, it's the only letter of the seven that has in it the words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, because it's the one that has to do with his second advent, when he will return again. And what was the problem with the Laodiceans? Was it that they were lining up at shops with nothing on the shelves? No. It was They were rich and increased with goods. They had need of nothing. That was their problem. And so that's the clear warning that our Lord has given. So with that as a background, I wanted to have a look at where this coronavirus crisis fits into Bible prophecy. So come back to Luke 21 and let's have a look at that. Now Luke 21, like all of the other records of the Olivet Prophecy, deals firstly with things that would happen in the events that led up to AD 70. And in Luke 21, that record begins in verse 5. This is what you would call the beginning of the Olivet Prophecy. And all the things that you read in Luke 21 up to verse 24, part A, has to do with the events leading up to AD 70. Particularly the savage period between AD 66 when the Romans came to deal with the insurrection in Judea through to AD 70. That four or five years, absolutely terrible. And of course, Brother Roberts in the last two chapters of the Ways of Providence actually distills the historical account of Josephus into a very, very simple historical record of the terrible events that occurred between AD 66 and AD 70. And when you read from verse 5 down to verse 24, that's what it's all about. However, we know that the events that led up to AD 70 set a pattern for for the events of our time when Christ would return again. The conditions would be different. See, when you read about what happened in AD 66 to AD 70, it was absolutely dreadful. That's why, for example, if you read in verse 22 and 23 of Luke 21, it says this. Now, we know that this is about AD 70 because verse 20 it says, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So this is, as he says in Matthew 24 verse 15, this is the fulfilment of the, the 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And when the Romans would come and they're called the people of the prince, they would come and they would invade Judea and they would overthrow Jerusalem and of course destroy the temple as they did. He says, when you see that, you know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then he calls upon them in verse 21, those that were living in Jerusalem at that time, he says, if you get an opportunity, get out. And that opportunity came when the Romans withdrew for a short time. And that allowed the believers to escape to a place called Pella across the Jordan. But you see, in verse 22 and 23, he tells us how awful the conditions would be. He says, verse 22, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there should be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And when you add to that the record of Matthew 24, he talks about 
pray that your journey be not in winter. Woe unto them that have got a child in their arms. Because you see, saying, you're going to have to go from Jerusalem and escape down through Jericho across the Jordan to get away. And that's going to be very difficult if you've got a young family. It's not going to be like that for us. It's going to be the opposite for us. When Christ comes, we'll be in times of prosperity. We'll be comfortable. There won't be any challenges for us to get from here to the judgment seat. That'll happen instantaneously. One moment we'll be here, the angels will turn up. Next moment we'll be at Sinai. No difficulty. Not a problem for pregnant mothers or families with young children. Not a problem like it was in the events leading up to AD 70. So while the conditions are different, nevertheless, the way that God prepared Judea for judgment is the way he's now preparing the earth for judgment. So we can get some hints as to what is likely to happen. And we're actually seeing it happen. So come back to Luke 21 and verse 9. So remembering that this is in the context of AD 70, but it's reflected in the way that God will prepare the earth for judgment for the second advent of Christ. Verse 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end, it says in the King James, not by and by. In the Greek, it actually means immediately. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. In other words, there's going to be international turmoil and warfare, as there was in those days. And then he says in verse 11, And great earthquakes shall be in different places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. I think we would put COVID-19 into the class of a pestilence. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And when you look at what's happening around the world, for example, in the northern regions of the African continent right now, there is a massive locust plague, which is wiping out crops. And there are famines around the world and earthquakes. So all of these things are actually now happening. We're seeing them and they actually have multiplied in the last 100 years. It's the same path that preceded AD 70. There was a preparation for the judgments that were to come. And we're seeing that preparation happen now before our eyes. So I think probably we can put the COVID-19 crisis into verse 11, bearing in mind that it's primarily and principally about the events that led up to AD 70. But it's a pattern of the way that God works to prepare for the judgments to come. In verse 11, there's one very interesting word. It's that word from. The word from there is the Greek preposition apo, A-P-O. And as in all languages, prepositions have an important part to play. And apo is the preposition that you use for origins, where things come from, what their source is. So it's a very good translation in the English because these signs are not accidental. They come from heaven. Preposition is telling us the origin. The origin is from heaven. In other words, the angels are involved. And Christ has sent forth the angels to manage some of these things so that they actually have an effect upon Bible prophecy, to fulfill Bible prophecy. And I don't think there's any doubt as to what is designed in this crisis that we're now going through. You'll all remember the global financial crisis of 2007 and 8, and the way that governments around the world responded to that. They, of course, opened the coffers poured money into the system in various ways. The American government, of course, well, they call it printing money. Uh, they weren't actually printing money in the sense of notes. They were just putting money out into the system by various mechanisms. Well, the same thing is now happening, and it's even happening on a greater scale than it did in the global financial crisis. In the global financial crisis, what they did guaranteed a depression in due time. Now they have done even more, so it's doubly guaranteed. And that depression is coming. Now, how do we fit that into Bible prophecy? Well, we go back to Luke 17. We start at verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, what he means by that, because what we have here is this reference to days in the plural, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. They were days of opportunity. You'll recall that in in the book of Genesis, we have God saying, Genesis chapter 6, man's days will be 120 years. In other words, I'm going to give him 120 years of opportunity from now until the flood. So that 120 years was the opportunity for not only Noah, build an ark, but for others to join him and to get in the ark when the disaster fell. Well, of course, only Noah and his family were involved, but they were days of opportunity. The same days of opportunity were given to Sodom. Because you'll remember in Genesis 14 when Lot and his family were taken away by Kidaliyoma and his confederacy and then rescued by Abraham, Lot went back to Sodom. He went back to live in Sodom, which was not a good idea. So here he was in a very prosperous and very corrupt society. And of course, he lost his ecclesia and he lost his family because of that society. He ended up losing his wife 
they were days of opportunity and they're likened to the days that will precede the return of Christ. So the prosperity of Noah's day, the prosperity of Lot's day is what the Lord chooses to represent the days in which we live. And he calls them here days of the Son of Man. Do you see that in verse 26? So shall it be also in the days, plural, of the Son of Man. In other words, identical to the pattern set in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Prosperous, corrupt, violent, all the things that we see. What were they doing? Well, verse 27. And to give the the Greek in its literal form, they were eating. So it's in the imperfect tense, an active voice. Imperfect tense is an action that's begun in operation. It's ongoing, but it doesn't get to finish. They were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying wives, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So there's the pattern. These days of opportunity were days of prosperity in which the servants of God were being challenged. And then, bang, it collapsed. But before it collapsed, Noah and his family were locked away in the ark. Same pattern in the days of Lot. Verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking. Now you can't even go to a restaurant right now. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about pub drinking and restaurant eating. You can't go to a pub or a restaurant right now. He will come when it all settles back to normal, when people go back to their normal way of life. So he goes on to say, they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. Now, you can only do those things with money in your pocket. You can't do those things without money in your pocket. So he's telling us when he's going to come, when times are normal. What happened in the days of Lot? Well... It all went on wonderfully until that day when the angels turned up in the evening and by morning Lot and his family were removed from the city and then the whole thing collapsed. Well, that's what I believe is happening right now. This is the beginning of the process that will lead to the collapse of the world's economy and financial systems and they will have a great depression and this will be the beginning of the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation on earth. Now, I want you to come back to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12 and verse 1 is about the return of Christ. And the very first thing he's going to do is raise the dead. And we read that if you read verses 1 and 2. Daniel 12 verse 1. Now here's a significant little phrase in this verse. And at that time. Now the time involved here of course is in relation to the prophecy that precedes it. And in chapter 11 from verse 40 to 45 we have the events of Armageddon and the Gogian invasion of the land. So in the preparations of this time, at that time, shall Michael stand up, and it's a reference to Christ, because he took over the task, he took over the job of Michael the archangel, when he arrived in heaven and took charge of the angels. He's Michael because, of course, the name means he who is like Ael, that is, one, the one who is like God. He shall stand up, the great prince, it's a reference back to chapter 9, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, so this is the phrase that we read in the first line of that verse, at that time, so these are concomitant events, they happen at the same time, at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now that means people who are in covenant relationship, doesn't it? It means people who are baptised into Christ and whose names are still in that book. Now, there are a lot of people whose names won't be in that book. For example, the generation we're reading about in in the book of Numbers right now. By Numbers chapter 14, the 600,000, maybe double that, that's the men, the 1.2 million people that came out of Egypt that were responsible 20 years and above, their names were taken out of the book of life. They're gone. So it's about those who have a covenant relationship with God, but whose names are still in that book of life. They should be delivered. In other words, they're going to be redeemed. They should be delivered. Every one that should be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and those whose names are not in the book to shame and everlasting contempt. Get the point of that? So there's the phrase, at that time. In other words, the concomitant events, events that happened at the same time are the return of Christ to raise the dead and the beginning of the time of trouble such as never was. All right, so there's your pattern. It was set in the days of Noah, it was set in the days of Lot. Prosperity, all the things that were distracting God's servants, bang, Christ returns, as it were, his people are locked away, the world collapses. There's your pattern. And I think what we're witnessing now in this coronavirus crisis is the last major step in the preparation for that collapse. There are many, many things we could say about that. One of them, of course, is that in October last year, 
There was the inversion of US Treasury bond rates, which happens very rarely, but when it happens, there's always, within 12 months, a huge economic collapse, and that looks like happening later this year. So I think things will return to normal within a few months, and people will go back. And you'd imagine what's going to happen when all of the restrictions are taken off for human rights. I think they're going to sort of just gently go back into their pub life and their restaurant life once they're up. No. It will be huge. They will be totally distracted from the reality. And the reality is that their underlying economy is gone. It's finished. And it will topple over the edge. And it, we know that crashes always come in October, in that period, September, October. And that's the period of the Day of Atonement, which is when I believe the resurrection will occur. And we won't be too long after that before we are taken to the judgment seat. So all of these things are preparation for significant days ahead for you and me. So the warning I think I wanted to bring out today was, yes, we need to see this present crisis for what it is. It's a preparation for the imminent return of Christ but things will be normal when he comes and that will be our challenge. Where will our mind be? Where will our lives be when things go back to normal? uh, Just to finish off, let's come back to Luke chapter 21 again. Let's come to the passages in Luke 21 that deal with our time. Now as I said, the early part of verse 24 is a reference to what happened in AD 70 and beyond in relation to the Jews. It says, They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, that treading down, we believe, and by the way, when David captured Jebus, and it reverted to its original name, to, to the name Jerusalem, or Salem as it was called in the days of Melchizedek, Jebus actually means trodden down. So there's a reference to Jebus becoming Jerusalem. It's going to be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now we believe that that was uh, the events of the Six Day War, in particular the 7th of June 1967 when the Israeli army uh, took control of Jerusalem. And that was the fulfilment of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Now Daniel 8.14 spoke about a period of 2,300 years. There's a fulfilment of Bible prophecy and and Gentile control of Jerusalem, which began with Alexander, ended in 1967. So that's a very, very significant year for us. Verse 25 then goes on to deal with what would immediately follow that. And modern historians will tell you that 1968 was the beginning of modern history. It severed the past from the future. And 68, of course, was the year in which the Vietnam War came to a crisis and there were riots and all sorts of things happening, riots throughout the world. In fact, Paris was turned upside down in that year. There were assassinations. All the things that were pointed to here in verse 25 were happening in that year and have continued to go on from 1968. There should be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, a word that we know that means with no way of escape. They can't see a way to escape the problems that beset them. The sea and the waves, symbols of course of peoples, of nations. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Now we can see how that could be applied to today. But in actual fact it really applies to the time after we take to the judgment seat when of course things are going to get really bad in that time of trouble such as never was and they're not going to be able to see a way clear of the problems that beset them it goes on to say at the end of verse 26 for the powers of heaven shall be shaken now in the greek it's very important to note that each of these words here at the end of verse 26 are in the plural you'll notice in the king james the word heaven singular that's not correct in the greek the plural should read the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and that's telling us that this applies to all nations, not just to one nation. You see, the the Olivet Prophecy was primarily about the things that happened to Judah's commonwealth. But this prophecy in verse 26 is about all nations would be shaken. And it says, verse 27, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, that word coming in verse 27 is erkamai. It means to move from one place to another. The word in is the word en, E-N, in the Greek, and it means to be within. So here we've got the Son of Man, a reference to Christ, moving from one place to another in a cloud with power and great glory. Now that can only be a reference 
Christ and the saints coming from Sinai into the land to deal with the Gargian invasion and to begin the process of setting up the kingdom of God. So what does that mean then? What it means, of course, is that between verse 25 and 27, in this period of turmoil that verse 25 speaks about, Christ has returned, he's raised the dead, things get a lot worse in the time of trouble such as never was, and then when things have calmed down a little bit, because they will calm down a little bit and they'll say peace and safety, that's when the Gogian invasion occurs and that's when Christ and the saints make their appearance in the land and the great earthquake, of course, does its job destroying the invading forces, humbling God's people, refashioning the whole shape of the land and indeed of the world and the rest we know after that will be the establishment of the kingdom. So there's his there's his warning about the way things will unfold. But then he says this in verse 28, And when these things begin to come to pass, notice this, when they begin to come to pass, and I think we are in that beginning, when they begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. I'm going to come back to that, but just before I do that, note what he then says in verses 29 and 30. He gives the sign of the fig tree, which we believe is a reference to the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. And he makes the point that the generation that's involved in that will not pass away till the kingdom's established. Generation is a lifetime. So people living at that time could be expected to still be alive when the kingdom's established. So come back then to the end of verse 28. Then look up and lift up your heads. Now this little phrase, look up, is very important. It's the Greek word, just the one Greek word, anakukto. And it means to raise oneself up, being elated in joyous expectation. It has the idea of raising yourself up. It's actually used only a few times in the New Testament. There are four occurrences, and two of them happen to occur in John chapter 8. So keep your hand in Luke 21 and come across to John chapter 8 and verses 7 and 10. Now this is the the record of Christ being presented with a woman caught in the act of adultery. We're familiar with the record. And it says in verse 6, it says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. To stoop down, of course, means you get down on your haunches. Verse 7 we read, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. Now there's the word anakukto, lifted up. He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Similarly again, he stoops down in verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And he was writing, we believe, their names in the earth, from the oldest to the youngest. But we won't go into that now. Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself. Now there is another occurrence of that word, anakukto. There's two of the four occurrences. Now it's pretty obvious when you get a picture of the Lord stooping down and then standing up as to what is meant in Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. Verse that says, when these things begin to come to pass then look up now when you read that phrase you think yeah just look up with using your head doesn't actually mean that actually means to get up you stoop you get up you stand up now why is that important here well because of the context when you come over to verse 35 words we read earlier we read this for as a snare shall the return of Christ come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now, the word dwell, we want to focus on that. It's the Greek word kathemai, and it means literally to sit down or to sit. And there are 89 occurrences of this Greek word in the New Testament. Every single one of the 89 except this one is rendered sit or sat. So it should be rendered sit here. There's no reason for them to use the word dwell. If they had been consistent, they would have used the word sit. What does that mean, do you think? For as a snare shall it come on all them that sit on the face of the whole earth. Well, that's about posture. And because this is a spiritual message, it's about spiritual posture. You know, we talk about couch potatoes. We talk about people who, it's in this technological age where people sit. There's a lot of sitting. Well, right now, you can't sit in a sports ground. You can't even sit in a place of worship. So you wouldn't say that that's right now, would you? It's talking about a time when people are comfortable, when they're relaxed, when they're sitting. That's when it's going to come. So that's the warning Christ's giving. So why is that use of the word sit important? Well, because of verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always. So prayer is a key element here as we read in the end of chapter 17 of Luke and the beginning of chapter 18. 
pray always that ye may be accounted worthy, and the word in the Greek means to deem entirely deserving, well of course we would be reluctant to say we were deserving, but it's talking about people who are ready, people who are ready for the return, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things that shall come to pass, and to stand, it doesn't say sit does it, it says stand, now that word stand is histemi in the Greek, it means to, to stand obviously, it's a good translation, to keep intact or to cause keep your place in other words to hold your place now there will be some people who will not hold their place when christ has waved them to the left they will be removed after the those on the right have been glorified they will be removed they will not keep their place in the presence of christ there will be others who will keep their place these are the people who lifted themselves up when they, when they saw the beginning, all of these things, they saw the signs, they lift themselves up. Why would you do that? Well, you see, it's a little bit like when the angels came to Lot's door. You hear a knock on the door, what do you do? Well, you lift yourself up and you go to the door and you open it. And that's the spiritual posture that we need to have, the readiness. Lot's wife wasn't ready. We need to have that spiritual <coughs> posture when that day comes. And it will come, as, as we've made pretty clear, I think. It will come when things are normal, when things are prosperous, when things are okay, and men are relaxed, not when they're in a state of heightened activity or sensitivity. So there's the Lord's warning and the the final words I want to use is from his mouth is in Matthew chapter 24. Now these words occur in the context of events that preceded AD 70 but they have a message for today as well. This is 12 and 13 of Matthew 24. And because iniquity shall abound, the word iniquity means lawlessness. The word abound means to be multiplied. Because lawlessness shall be multiplied, the love, the agape, the sacrificial love, the love of service of the many, there's an article in the Greek, the love of the many shall wax cold. The word wax cold is one Greek word, suko. It means to cool by blowing through evaporation. So you wet your finger and blow upon it. That side is cooler than the other side because there's evaporation. It's talking about the constant blowing, the chilling wind of lawlessness, which saps the love, the commitment of people. He says, the love of the many shall wax cold. It just so happens that that verb, wax cold, suko, is in the passive voice. There's not a great deal that we can do about this. It's happening to everyone. See, passive voice means you're the receiver of someone else's actions. Actions come from elsewhere. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the word endure is hupermino. It means to remain behind after others have gone. To keep one's ground. To hold out. To bear up. That's a bit like standing in the presence of the Son of Man, isn't it? And that verb is in the active voice in the Greek. What's that mean? You're the doer. So we can't help the way that the world's blowing this cold air out. Can't help that. That's happened to everybody. But we can do something about it. We can bear up. We can hold out. Even after others have gone, we can hold out. That's what we do. And then it says, the same shall be saved. Guess what? That verb's in the passive voice. In other words, we're the receiver of someone else's actions. We're not going to save ourselves. God will save us because we have the right spiritual posture. He will do the saving. Very, very important message, isn't it? He that shall endure unto the end, the same, shall be saved. There's an assurance in that. There's a positiveness about that. And so we can be very thankful that we're able now to remember the sacrifice of Christ, remember the sacrifice of Christ, remember the sacrifice of Christ, remember the sacrifice of Christ.